Well, welcome back to the Damage Report. I am Ravana filling in for John Ida Roland. Every time the intro song plays at the end, I have to do done, 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 done right before the camera cuts to me. It's so catchy. I love it so much. <laughs> um, all right, with that being said, we got a lot of stories we're going to get through. Today, we're going to talk some updates on the devastating earthquakes in Morocco. Um, we're going to talk about Trump's lackluster weekend in Iowa. Um, we're gonna talk about some things happening in the state of Ohio. And speaking of the state of Ohio, joining me to talk about all these stories and more today is Senator Nina Turner. Senator Turner, thank you so much for being here with me today. I am so looking forward to the show. <laughs> I am too, Ray. It was great to be it's great to be with you today, and it was great to be with you on the main show on Friday. Right, we got Friday. we got some some back to back show action now. Ended last week, great. We're gonna start this week, great. Um, so with that, are you ready to jump into this first story? I am. Okay, everybody, we're gonna do some updates out of Morocco. So let's watch this really quick. The death toll continues to climb. More than 2,100 people are now confirmed dead after the country was hit by a 6.8 magnitude quake, the strongest. In more than 120 years, both Spain and the UK have sent search and rescue teams to help as other international aid is also being pledged. Near the quake's epicenter in the Atlas Mountains, scenes of destruction and devastation with homes in small villages reduced to piles of rubble. Many people have spent another night outside. Now the frustration and desperation is building, especially in some of the hard hit and remote areas. Some just truly devastating scenes coming out of Morocco. They were hit with a 6.8 magnitude earthquake, which shook the country and claimed the lives of thousands. And that number is expected to continue to rise as rescue efforts continue. Now, more than 300,000 people have been affected in Marrakesh and surrounding areas, according to the WHO. Now, according to US Geological Survey, earthquakes of this size in the region are very uncommon, but not completely unexpected. It noted that nine earthquakes with a magnitude of five or higher have hit the area since the year 1900, but none of them have had a magnitude higher than six. Just a reminder, this one was a 6.8 and CNN did some excellent reporting on this. So let's turn to this from them. The quake is the strongest to hit the nation's center in more than a century, and its epicenter was not far from popular tourist and economic hub Marrakesh. At least 2,497 people have been killed in the disaster, and 2,476 have been injured, state media said on Monday. And as I mentioned earlier, the death toll is expected to rise, not just as they unbury bodies from the rubble and continue to count the currently dead. But because the housing in the area is not built to withstand earthquakes, so buildings that have been damaged by the earthquake are expected to continue to collapse, which is expected to take the lives of more Moroccans, hopefully and we'll get into this in a, in a minute, the you know efforts to rescue and, and uh, the efforts the humanitarian aid can help mitigate those numbers. But we don't have a perfect picture right now of just how devastating this tragedy is going to be. Now, of course, as is so often the case when we see these horrific tragedies, that the poorest people in the country are expected to be affected the worst. From the Washington Post, the worst hit provinces are among the poorest in Morocco with some homes lacking electricity or running water, even in better times. Rural Moroccans have struggled in recent years to recover from the economic shock of the pandemic and more recently to cope with inflation and rising food prices. Now we have a map here so you can get an idea of just how large this affected area is with the epicenter in the dark red in the center being impacted the worst. And as you go out, less and less impact, not that it still isn't devastating for them. And just to paint a you know better picture of what it looks like in Morocco, we have this video of the earthquake. So you can see here the damage to the building structures. I mean, to some extent, just completely leveled homes, entire communities. And there's a search and rescue team, but many Moroccans had to dig their relatives and loved ones out of the rubble by hand. Because there's so, so many affected areas that it's difficult for government assistance to even reach in the first place. Now, speaking of which, there has been international assistance offered. 
But Morocco has yet to accept aid from most of the countries offering assistance, including the United States. Offers of support have poured in from around the world and specialized rescue crews across the European Union stood ready to deploy. An assessment team from the United States arrived Sunday to support the efforts of the Moroccan government. But by late Sunday, Moroccan authorities had accepted help from only a handful of countries. Now. The Moroccan government has, you know, put into place, you know, some plans to help rescue. They've are, they've started some missions to help rescue people and provide relief. Um, and just more on that, Morocco has deployed its army to lead search and rescue efforts and has mobilized more than 1,000 doctors and 1,500 nurses. Aid groups have set up shelters for residents who lost their homes or who cannot return to them due to structural damage or fear of. Aftershocks, but there are still massive gaps, as I mentioned earlier, and and where the government is able to reach and how much aid they're able to give to this the massive number of people who have been impacted by this. So, communities near the epicenter of Morocco's powerful earthquake were a picture of devastation and anger Sunday, as residents described using their bare hands to pull loved ones from the rubble. In most places, there was no sign of government promised rescue teams. And there was no word yet from many villages higher up in the mountains. And just on that, I was reading this morning that so much of, and it's it's sad to see, you know, the ways in which, you know, of course there's limitations just based on where some of the residents impacted are living and, and the ability of the Moroccan government to reach them. But I mean, Senator Turner, it was devastating reading about how, I mean, there, it says something about the resiliency of the human spirit, but it was so sad to read that people whose houses were only half destroyed, you know, were taking in the people whose houses were completely destroyed and sharing all that they had in these communities have really come together to help one another and and that's wonderful but it's it's also quite sad because it's it's happening in the wake of the government not providing enough assistance for those people that they have to fill in those gaps yeah right i mean this is a harsh example of why government does matter and barring some miss something that I'm missing about why the Moroccan government is slow to accept aid from other countries, it's the height of irresponsibility for them not to because of the magnitude of this devastation, the kind of situation that we're dealing with. All politics should be put put aside if that's one of the rationales for the Moroccan government to decide whose aid they're gonna accept and whose they're not. People are literally dying. People have already died. People are fighting for their lives. And you, at this moment, accept the help. Again, and Ray, I, I want to qualify that by saying, if I'm missing something, then you know I, I want to know. But other than that, accept the help. Condolences out to the people who have lost their loved ones during this natural disaster. This can happen anywhere at any time to anybody, which leads to the question, Ray. What do what what is government doing in the meantime, in between time, knowing that these structures? I mean, you laid out and big ups again to CNN for their reporting and so many others that are reporting very deeply on this. What are countries doing in the meantime, in between time to shore up infrastructure? We all know, even right here in the United States of America, we have infrastructure failings as well. Are we going to just simply wait for a natural disaster to happen to say, whoops? We should have worked on that 20 years ago, or in this case, 120 years ago. It's been 120 years, according to the reporting, since a, a earthquake of this magnitude has hit that country. What is government waiting on? I mean, one of the things that can be done to help people who suffer disproportionately, and even those who don't, is to sure up a nation's and cities by that, you know, by extension, infrastructure. That is such an excellent point because you know it reminds me of and there was a lot of you know comparison in the articles between what happened in Turkey and now the earthquake in Morocco and when we saw the devastation in Turkey I mean they had tens of thousands of people die you look at who was dying it was the poor people in Turkey it was the Kurdish people in Turkey who have you know had their infrastructure you know, routinely, <laughs> you know, undermined by the government. You know, these are the poor areas that don't have the same, you know, uh, well built infrastructure. So they're the buildings collapsed more easily than they otherwise would have. So, I mean, it is it's such an important question to ask, you know, why are we waiting until we are counting the thousands of dead bodies and not doing something in the meantime. And I mean, you know, even here in the United States, we, you know, even in states like California, one wildfire away from 
you know, a huge death toll in states like Texas, you know, one <laughs> power like down power line, one blown transformer away from elderly people freezing to deaths in their own home. It, it's a nightmare and just you know, just to bring climate change into this as well. You know, we're gonna see more and more of these disasters. And if we're not seeing the same, you know, robust action to meet that, you know, on the one hand to mitigate the effects of climate change, but also to bolster our infrastructure, we're just gonna be counting the dead more and more as time goes on. And, you know, I'll let you get the last word in on this, Senator. Well, that's exactly right, Ray, and there's really no excuse for this. In the 21st century, we have more technology, more knowledge, more even understanding of the pattern of natural disasters that we, in your words, we can start to mitigate some things. And infrastructure, having strong infrastructure in any nation is one of the best social contract activities that government can do. We can't sure up infrastructure as individuals, we sure up infrastructure as a group, as a people, as a nation, whatever that nation is, whether it be Morocco or the United States of America or Canada, that's how you sure up infrastructure. So somebody or a group of somebody should be thinking about this all the time. And, and at what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. I'm taking that from MLK Jr., Reverend Doctor. But that is so true, Ray. So the people who are at the heart of the destruction and the disaster, it also has a ripple effect to other people, to other countries. So it is in all of our benefit, even if people don't want to do things for moral reasons, which I don't understand why they wouldn't. But there are some people that morality doesn't, you know, doing something because it's the right thing to do doesn't even enter their mind. There is an economic and societal, a, a holistic societal benefit to ensure to ensuring that infrastructure is, is sound and we know that this impacts tourism in that nation as well that's that's economic so we got to show up our people and my last point ray when you talked about or described how folks have to dig out their loved ones because governments react is slow. You know, this is really a moment where it is going to take government intervention and also individual intervention. But individual intervention can only go so far. So I want to end my comments the way that I started. This is an absolute pristine example as to why robust government is necessary to be able to lift people out of situations that they cannot do as individuals. This is collective effort here. Absolutely, and hopefully, you know, we'll hear more in the next couple of days about Morocco's accepting aid from more countries. Hopefully, hopefully there'll be a more robust response to, you know, helping people get out of their homes, find temporary housing, eventually find permanent housing, and we'll keep all of you updated on that as we go through the week. But now let's turn to a very different type of story. Um, Trump's own type of disaster in Iowa. So let's watch. So Trump's weekend trip to Iowa was a bit of a mixed bag for the former president. So as you could hear in that video, he was booed a lot. Of course, there was also cheers, but there was pretty loud boos. Although that some supporters of his have put out edited video of the footage to try to make it sound like it was only cheers, which I think is very, very funny. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't quite a reflection on the reality of the weekend. But what is is this banner that flew over the stadium. I was watching the uh, Iowa football game. It says, where's Melania? And <laughs> discussing a little bit of making a reference to the fact that Melania has been conspicuously absent from the campaign trail. Although anyone who's been paying attention to <laughs> their family a little bit for the past six or so years knows that she's not exactly fond of her husband. So another thing that happened in Iowa was this, I really don't know what it is Dr. Fauci and Trump both wearing masks. I'm pretty sure it's an attack on Trump from the right saying that Trump is pro-vax and pro-mask. Um, but there they are. And so it was a mixed bag 
in Iowa for Donald Trump. I wouldn't describe it that way for Ron DeSantis. He had a bad weekend. Let's take a look. We cut it off right before you hear it, but at the end of that video, the woman recording yells out something like, you suck to Ron DeSantis at the end. But so he didn't exactly get a warm welcome in Iowa, but he was doing some tricks that you'll see in a minute to try to, I don't know, throw anything against the wall and see what sticks for his campaign. He's getting desperate in the polling, and that is why he is this week's Monday Menace. <laughs> I'm sure all of you haven't forgotten the exceptionally homophobic ad that Ron DeSantis's PAC never back down released, nor probably have forgotten the ad that featured Nazi symbols that was released by his campaign. Um, so <laughs> not a great track record for Ron DeSantis in legislation or in campaigning, but his never back down PAC doubled down and played this horrific ad during the Iowa game this weekend. Why do liberals have to ruin everything? Pushing their transgender insanity everywhere. Cheerleading, your daughter's locker room, Sports Illustrated, even the Miss Universe competition. That was Donald Trump's doing. Can transgender women compete? Yes. Trump let biological men compete in his women's beauty pageant. Now look where we are. Enough of this crap. It's time to end the insanity. We're not going to let you impose an agenda on our kids. We're going to stand up for our kids. Ron DeSantis for president. Never back down is responsible for the content of this advertising. So I guess the pushback against his very weird and gross other homophobic ads didn't mean anything to his campaign that's being run by someone who's incidentally never run a campaign before, national, local, or otherwise. So they did this. And is it going to work in Iowa? People who follow, you know, primary politics for years would probably tell you that this is a dumb way to go, and the polling might suggest that that's also true. Because let's pull up this uh, this caucus graph. Yeah, Trump is far and away going to win the Iowa caucus. All right, <laughs> it's it's all he's going to win the Republican nomination. It's set and done. Everyone else on that screen is running for a VP spot. DeSantis is not because he has a very now fraught relationship with Donald Trump. So obviously he's in second here um, with Nikki Haley in third and first choice votes and Ramaswamy in fourth with Tim Scott in rounding it out in fifth. But I mean, Senator Turner, one thing I'll say is, you know, as a member of the LGBTQ community, you know, I obviously the intense homophobia, transphobia that's been levied against us by people in positions of power like Ron DeSantis and state legislators is horrifying. But one thing that I take solace in is knowing that most people are not as grotesquely homophobic and transphobic as DeSantis, and that these types of ads don't resonate with them. In fact, they creep them out. Yeah, that's a that, that is a great point, Ray, and thank God for that. The problem with DeSantis is that he has power, though, and that's what makes his brand of homophobia even that much more wrought with danger. Is because he uses this in a very powerful way to marginalize an already marginalized community. I don't think that the people of Iowa are going to buy it anyway. Most people are focused on their own personal economy. Is economics? economics and then economics, what is happening in the pocketbooks of the American people. And right there in Iowa, they're suffering under the same weight of an economy does not, that does not work for working class people as anybody else in this country, whether it's California, Illinois, or even Ohio. So no, it is not going to work. And the lady that blurted out, you suck, was exactly right. Let's bold it, underline it, exclamation point, put it in a message in a bottle. So that the DeSantis campaign can understand. And the reason why he doubles down or quadruples down on culture wars is he has no message and he has no vision. So this is just a covering for him for his inadequacies. And he has many of them. Now back to former President Donald J. Trump. Look, he can suffer a few boos. You know, he got cheers as you laid out and he got jeers. 
he can he can take it. I mean, the polling that you just put out there, he's far and away ahead of any other Republican candidate and barring something happening to him, you know, either on the legal side or some or any anything else him having to jump out of this race, Trump absolutely will be the nominee. You heard it here for Ray and I letting y'all know unless something extraordinary happens to stop it, Trump is going to be the 2024 Republican nominee. Yeah, I would say save for Donald Trump literally dying. Yeah, he could be oh, right, you said. I see. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, that that's it right there. I mean, just just put it on out there. I was trying not to say it that directly, but since you, Amen. Short of him dying, which we are not, we are not wishing that on him or anybody else. People live, people die, babies. That you know, people. It's a process of life, so we're not saying that's what we want to happen. Even though some people would be crass enough to say that I'm not, you know, I'm not in that camp. That's not my, you know, that's not my. I I, I don't have the power of life and death. But you're right, Ray. Barring him dying or something else happening to him, he will be the nominee. Yeah, and even even if he does die, I'm sure he'll still get a, some, probably more votes than Tim Scott's gonna get. But <laughs> oh yeah, he'll be a martyr for sure. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, even right now, he is, and he's still very much alive. Trump has a type of power, Ray, that I think and influence. That I really believe that if the Democrats are not careful, we are definitely gonna have a repeat of 2016 if they keep ignoring um, the, the prowess of Donald J. Trump. You don't have to agree with his policies, you don't have to agree with his homophobia, his whatever, all, all, all the things, neo fascism, any of that, to say, to know, to tell the truth about the type of power that this man has. Absolutely. And I think that we've seen a lot of, you know, mainstream media sort of downplaying that and, you know, overplaying their hand a little bit on how much the Republican voters are somehow going to be swayed. I mean, these are people that have stayed with him through controversy after controversy, crime after crime. They're going to stay with him. They've stayed with him through the indictments. They're going to stay with him through the trials. They're going to stay with him at the point of a conviction. And we have to be, you know, we have to be adamant. And you know, fighting him and calling out the Democratic Party for running a candidate who I'm sorry is not. And we'll talk about you know <laughs> aging candidates later on in the show, but not doesn't necessarily have the mental acuteness to be running the type of campaign that's going to be needed. Uh, you know, as we get into the uh, general election. So, um, all right, we're out of time. We got to go to a break, but we'll be right back with some more stories. We're going to be talking about Ohio after this. All right, we're back on the damage report and we're gonna head to a story that's close to home for Senator Turner because it's things that are going down in the state of Iowa and some GOP attempted trickery. So let's get into this. Abortion rights are gonna be on the ballot in Ohio and the GOP is so desperate to ban abortion. They're trying to change the language on the ballot to trick the voters. Now, this wouldn't be the first time this happened, uh, GOP trickery in a ballot measure. But the good news is that the Democrats in the state are fighting them on this because the Republican controlled Ohio ballot board is now attempting to insert the term unborn child into a ballot referendum, which just incidentally, unborn child is not a legal term. It's not a term that's used in the actual text of, <laughs> of the ballot measure. It's not you know, a, a medical term, it is a political term and it's meant to confuse the voters. And that's exactly why they're trying to put it in there. But it is being challenged before the state Supreme Court in a lawsuit filed on Monday. So let's get into some NBC News reporting about this. The lawsuit was filed by Ohioans United for Reproductive Rights and five petitioners who had submitted the original ballot language, calling the board summary a naked attempt to mislead. The 137 page lawsuit argued the ballot board's approved language is irreparably flawed and asked the court to direct the board to reconvene and adopt ballot language that properly and lawfully describes the amendment. The change text adds four uses of the words unborn child, a term used by anti-abortion activists that never appeared in the referendum wording in the petitions that were signed to get the measure on the ballot. Now, the original proposed amendment says that abortion may be prohibited after fetal viability, though it cannot be prohibited if it was if it is necessary to protect the patient's life or health. 
Ohio's Republican Secretary of State Frank LaRose incorrectly asserted on social media the same day the language was changed that the proposed referendum would allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth, which is so infuriating to see someone using their, their position and the office that they hold to espouse lies. And we see it with this, you know, the Democrats want abortion on demand up to the point of birth. They want abortion on demand after birth and <laughs> the post birth abortion. And every time I have to listen to these Republican lies, I'm thinking, you know, how late does a post birth abortion go? Because I could use one right now to not have to hear any more of this complete nonsense. It's so ridiculous. So, you know, instead of talking about these Republican lies, let's talk about the actual text of the lawsuit and what they're actually fighting for in the state. So, from that lawsuit, that term, that fraught term is in referring to unborn child. That fraught term is in stark contrast to the neutral, accurate, and scientifically accepted terminology that the amendment itself uses and defines. Which I'll just pause for a second, which is exceptionally important. You know, I, for the viewers who might not know, I went to law school. I took legislation, how to write legislation, how to interpret legislation, and it is so crucial to define the terms in your legislation. And the fact that the term unborn child doesn't appear in the legislation is what is so horrific about trying to use it on the ballot. Because it's not a defined term in the same way that the terms that should, that they are using in the amendment are. It doesn't have a clear definition. And that's the point that the lawsuit makes. So let me get back to their words. The ballot language thus unnecessarily introduces an ethical judgment. At what stage of development a zygote, embryo, or fetus becomes a child, which is beyond the scope of the measure and about which Ohioans profoundly disagree. And if you're wondering just how anti-abortion the Frank LaRose is, you know, you let's just take a quick look at his Twitter. Jen Psaki tweeted, no one supports abortion up until birth, which, you know, obviously what she's meaning is no one supports it up until birth, you know, at will. You know, no one is carrying a child for eight to nine months, seven, eight, nine months, and then just decides on a whim, I don't want this anymore. That's not what happens. And just by the way, abortions that happen, you know, in the seventh, eighth month of pregnancy are <laughs> abortions that happen then are less than 1% of abortions, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of abortions. And in almost every state in this country, in fact, every state in this country, it is not legal. A doctor won't perform an abortion at whim that late into the pregnancy. So it's so disingenuous. But let's just talk about how disingenuous his words are here. He tweeted, the radical left wants to amend Ohio's constitution to allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth, which we just read the language. We know that's not what it says at all. Glad Jen agrees here that everyone should vote no on issue one in November. And just one more from him, he tweeted this out. An abortion, on uh, an abortion on demand amendment was passed in Michigan. No, it wasn't, but that wasn't enough for the radical left. They're now trying to remove parental consent for minors to make healthcare decisions. So it was putting some anti-trans propaganda in there too. We can all see the clear erosion of parental rights. Vote no on issue one so it doesn't happen in Ohio. And, and Senator Turner, I mean, this is such an important, <laughs> important thing for Ohioans to go to the poll and vote on and having the Republicans just try everything they can to to restrict you know, women's bodily autonomy. And for someone in such a high position of authority to be lying like this to the public is really upsetting. Well, trickery is all they have left, right? That's all they know. They tried to do it with issue one that was on the special election ballot in August while they wasted taxpayers dollars. That $20 million could have went towards so many other things to edify the great people of the state. But oh no, they wanted to try to stop, you know, stop voters from weighing in, but I am so glad that voters from across the political spectrum rejected issue one during the special election. Now here we have another issue one in the general election that has everything to do with abortion access. And here and, and Frank LaRose, Secretary of State, is lying once again. I'm very disappointed in him because I served in the Ohio Senate with him and I think he's gotten worse and worse. You know, not that he was a plum at the, you know, when I was there with him in the Senate, but he certainly has gotten more radical. You want to talk about radical, he is very much a representation of the radical right. And then lastly on this, Ray, you talk about unborn, unborn child. Now you laid out that nobody, you know, that wasn't even in row, you know, and we just talked about how 
the national the national Republican Party is really adopting Roe and telling Republicans stop playing games with this. Just go ahead. It's the language that was in Roe. They already overturned Roe. Nobody is supporting that kind of abortion. I love the point that you laid out that that kind of seventh, eighth, or even ninth month abortion is incredibly rare, and there would have to be something extraordinarily health related for anybody. You know, it's just ridiculous. But they don't cut. They don't care about the birth of a child. They are pro birth. They are not pro child because if they were pro child, then they would be for increasing the minimum wage. They would be for unions. Right? They would be for the things pay family medical leave. They would be for uh, free public colleges and universities or framed another way us having a social contract that we make the same investments in that type of public education as we do K through 12. Just go and put it together and support paying for K through college education for people as a social contract. They are not that. They would be for clean air, clean water, and clean food. But that's not where they are. They are strictly only want to control a woman's ability to control her own body. Nothing more or nothing less. They are hypocrites. And I am so glad that this organization is pushing back and suing them. And I hope that the Ohio Supreme Court rules in the proper way. I served also, Ray, on the ballot board before when I was in the, the Ohio Senate. And that language is so, that language should be written in common terms. Don't play games with people. But they do these things to try to confuse folks. This is not the first time and it won't be the last time. But I hope that Ohio ones push back on them just as they did in the primary. Absolutely. And I mean, the Republican argument of a little bit has been, oh, you don't think the voters are smart enough to understand what we mean when we say, you know, unborn child. But it's like, but you're the ones who think the voters are dumb. You're That's the right. ones arguing that the voters are so are dumb that they won't see that we're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And you know, and of course, the Democratic Party saw it immediately. You know, the abortion rights groups saw it immediately and started fighting against it. So. <sighs> Gosh, I'm so, it just makes me so angry. <laughs> but oh, yeah. you know, we'll we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep everyone updated as it moves on. <laughs> but um Let's move, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about somebody who's having a, a bad day for very stupid reasons. That would be one Marjorie Taylor Greene. Because, <laughs> you know, I would usually say at this point that a primary is heating up, that the Republican presidential primary is heating up. But that would be a lie because, as we've laid out on the show already today, it's already sort of set in stone done deal for Donald Trump. So it's not really heating up. But what is heating up is the contest between the losers essentially to try to be Trump's VP. But it's not apparently heating up for one of Trump's fiercest defenders because she's being left behind. Let's take a look at this reporting from Newsweek. Just 1% of American voters want Marjorie Taylor Greene to be Donald Trump's vice presidential pick. Should he win the Republican presidential nomination according to a new survey conducted exclusively for Newsweek. So despite all of her defenses of Donald Trump, despite all of her attacks on Joe Biden, and despite her dedication to pushing the big lie, Republican voters don't want Marge. This is probably particularly insulting to Green, who just recently bragged about knowing that she was on Donald Trump's shortlist for Veep. But let's just pull up who they do want from this uh, this poll. Apparently, Vivek Ramaswamy, which I have. Okay, first, if you're a Republican voter and you think that Donald Trump is going to put the name Ramaswamy after his on yard signs, if you think the Republican Party isn't so racist that they wouldn't let a man with a last name like Ramaswamy <laughs> be the vice president, then I don't know what year you're living in <laughs> because that is absolutely the case. But if we could pull it back up just for one second, the second most high one is just don't know. And then third is Mike Pence, which is exceptionally funny because, of course, of course, Mike Pence isn't going to be his VP pick. You know, Mike Pence did one good thing as vice president, and that was, you know, not literally try to steal the election. And because he did one good thing, he is dead to Donald Trump forever. Donald Trump, who I often refer to as the pettiest bitch in America. But I mean, Senator Turner, it really is, it is just a, a you know, we see a lot of these candidates who are obviously just vying to be VP. 
I can't help but think it's hysterical to see Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's done everything that she possibly can to suck up to Donald Trump, and the voters still they still don't want her. <laughs> well, Donald J. Trump may like MTG, but the, he, he's by himself on this one. He's the mm -hmm. only one that does, at least according to this polling. So nothing delights me even more than the Republican voters are rejecting this chick. And your point about Ramashami, not gonna happen. First of all, not, not because of his last name in my estimation, which that is a point well made. But you can't have a bigger ego than Donald J. Trump and be mm -hmm. on his ticket. That's why Pence was the perfect yin to his yang. And I use that loose. I probably shouldn't even use yin and yang the same. Let me let me reject that that example I gave. Pence balanced Trump out, but that, you know, just because he wasn't Trump's lapdog when it came to trying to overthrow the will of a will of the voters in 2020, he got kicked out of the out of the uh, out of the tower, so to speak, because of that, so Pence is out. I don't know. I think Trump made a, a calculated mistake by by kicking Pence out because Pence is the one person that you know didn't bring a whole lot of ego to the table. Understood that Trump was the big dog, so to speak. Ramashami would never do that, and so Trump would be having to, to duke it out with him on a regular basis. He's not gonna have anybody that got a bigger ego than he does on his ticket. Just plain. And simple. Absolutely, and I have seen some Republicans, you know, make the argument that um, because Donald Trump is going to be, you know, sort of distracted by the uh, by all of the trials he's going to be going through, you know, at the heart of the primary season and event, moving into the general election, that he needs someone with a big personality like Ramaswamy, which I think is really funny because let's just can we just pull up graphics five and then six because Trump doesn't feel that way at all because this is what he had to say. And in a radio interview this week, Mr. Trump told Hugh Hewitt, a conservative talk show host, that he was unlikely to make an early decision on a vice president, brushing aside the idea that his running mate could help campaign next spring when the former president is facing multiple criminal trials. Continues on, he says, there's never been a vice president that got a president elected because it doesn't work that way, Mr. Trump said. It sounds good and everything, but the president gets himself elected. I think that that just gives you know, <laughs> that goes so, so in line with what you were just saying that he doesn't want someone with a bigger ego than him. And I mean, it, that is so evidence of what he just said. You know, I don't want a vice president to get me elected. He'd rather lose than have a vice president, you know, who's, who's maybe charismatic enough to get him elected. Um, but I'll just let you get the last thoughts in on this story. Well, you're not totally wrong, Ray, in that comment. I mean, you don't have to, we don't agree with most of what he said, but that makes practical sense. It is the name at the top of the ticket, so to speak, that carries the most heft. And God forbid if anybody else on that ticket <laughs> even thinks that they carry more heft than him. He's just not gonna do it. I think Trump may surprise everybody and pick a woman this time. I, I really do. Uh, we'll see, that remains to be seen. But what we do know, it will not be well, I won't say it won't be because Trump might just do it for the hell of it. But let's just say the poll shows right now that the, the Republican voters do not want it to be Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene. Right, I was thinking maybe someone more like Nikki Haley or Christy Nome. We'll see moving forward, but apparently, according to Trump, it won't be for quite some time that he makes that decision. All right, we gotta go to our next break, but stick around because after this, we're gonna be talking about uh, we're gonna be talking about the indictment. We're gonna be talking about Chris Christie, and then we're gonna get a little bit into actually, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the indictment. We'll talk about Chris Christie. We'll talk about Nikki Haley after this. I'm patting myself on the back a little bit for wrapping that up just as I was watching uh, <laughs> watching our producer's fingers stick down. I was like, I'm gonna stretch this out, I'm gonna finish it at the last second and I did it. <laughs> but anyone who's watching on linear might be a little bit confused right now, that's fine, <laughs> this is fine. Um, let's get into this next story um, and let's watch some of Chris Christie's thoughts on Trump's indictment. 60% of Republicans consistently say they don't buy these charges. They think it's bogus, they think it's partisan, they think it's weaponization of law enforcement. So are you misjudging the current state of the GOP? No, I think the questions are wrong. You can believe that these charges are unfair, but there are two things. One, we have to deal with them. Whether you think they're unfair or not, they are going to impact independent voters and soft Democrats in the general election. 
both sets of people we need to win a general election as Republicans. And Donald Trump cannot win those people while he's under indictment of four cases. I'll say if 60% of the Republican voters believe that the charges against Donald Trump are false and fraudulent and unfair, that is a much bigger indictment of the Republican voting base than that is, you know, any indication of the legitimacy of these charges. That out of the way, you just heard Chris Christie. Nikki Haley, you might have heard last week responded that Americans won't vote for a felon. So do the two of them have a point? Well, Let's look at this reporting from The Hill. Polls showed 54% of Americans said Trump should face federal criminal charges. Independent voters notably said they support prosecuting Trump for the alleged federal crimes in question by 20 points. 57% said they support and 37% said they do not. So there is absolutely something to what Chris Christie was saying there, that if they want to win over these independent voters, which, you know, that's how you win an election, then maybe they may need to go with a different candidate. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that Chris Christie is ever gonna be president of the United States. I don't think that he is either, but it's nice and refreshing to at least hear someone within the Republican Party saying this because I feel like I've been going crazy for the past, well, honest to God, maybe six, seven years now, <laughs> eight years. I mean, how long has it been at this point? <laughs> um, but, you know, regardless of where, Christie finishes in the polling. I have a feeling that this is eventually going to be in a Biden ad one day. But secondly, let's look at the conduct. This is a guy who stole classified documents from the White House, hid them from his own lawyers, hid them from the government for 18 months. And on January 6th, he told those folks the election was stolen. That's a lie. He asked them to march up to Capitol Hill. Said he would walk with them, but Howie, you and I both know if that Donald Trump has a risk of breaking a fingernail, he's not going to take that risk. He sat in his office for three hours and watched the people that he had lied to and sent up to Capitol Hill desecrate Capitol Hill. Now, I just think that's conduct that's beneath what we should expect from a president of the United States. <laughs> Senator Turner, I think it's like a sad state of affairs that just saying something that is this objectively true, you know, on right wing media as a Republican gets you a lot of credit because I'll give him credit because he's one of the only people doing it. But it's sad that that is the reality of, you know, party politics in this country. Well, Chris Christie is no stranger to petty politics. I mean, we know <laughs> what he did in his own state to slow down traffic and things like that. The pushback against people who did not support or endorse him. So he right up there with Donald J. Trump with the petty. While all of that, those things may be true that Americans won't vote for a felon, that, that, remain, that remains to be seen. But we can't get to that until you get through the primary. And it's obvious that some Americans will vote for a convicted felon. Now, let me put a caveat, Donald J. Trump has not been convicted. So we gotta be clear here, he's going through you know all of these cases and charges and all that kind of things. Now he's been impeached twice, but he's still going through uh, the courts. You know, his the, he's, he's been charged, but the, the outcome has not been decided. So I wanna put that in the parking lot for a minute. My major point here is that folks can say that all they want, but the primary voter, the Republican primary voters being polled so far at this stage of the game are saying that they want Donald J. Trump to be the general election candidate. See, you can't get through the general, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, obviously before you get through the primary. So Ray, I don't know, there's a conflict there because ultimately if the polling in the Republican primary holds out, there are some people who are willing to vote and this man is going to make it to the general election. So far, that's what's, what it's looking like. That's the handwriting on the wall. That in and of itself is a total contradiction. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, and of course, they've deluded themselves, so many of his supporters, into believing, like we said at the beginning of the story, that the charges are fake, that, you know, that Donald Trump is being politically prosecuted, and that he is, you know, the God King Emperor and the rightful president of the United States, and whatever else that he has convinced them, and online messaging boards and horrible memes on Facebook have convinced these people to believe. But 
Um, uh, you know, we'll keep our eye out on whether or not Trump's going to participate in the debate. Chris Christie had some choice words for him on that. But let's move into this next story because I, th I think it's really important to talk about this because it's not often that we uh, see this type of action in the face of gun violence. Let's take a look. We are suspending open and concealed carry. The purpose is to try to create a cooling off period while we figure out how we can better address public safety and gun violence. So federal action on gun control has been less than what most gun advocates would have hoped for under the Biden administration. There have been some recent moves in our states. Now, one example is who you just saw there, New Mexico's governor, Michelle Luan Grisham, temporarily banned the right to carry firearms in public. Which is crazy that you think that you have a God ordained right to carry a killing machine on you in a public space. But that's neither here nor there. Let's examine this closer and then weigh in on it. Let's take a look at this reporting from ABC News. Luan Grisham issued a on Friday a 30 day suspension of open and concealed carry laws in Bernalillo County where Albuquerque, the state's most populous city is seated. There are exceptions for law enforcement officers and licensed security guards. The move comes a day after she declared gun violence a public health emergency in the state. So the idea that there's, you know, people are coming to take your guns is the right wing in the state has already started to frame it is completely untrue. Now it's just a 30 day suspension and residents with gun permits can still have weapons on private property. Now. While traveling with a gun, a person must transport it in a way that makes the firearm inoperable or be subject to fines up to $5,000. Now from that same ABC report, the Democratic governor cited the recent shooting deaths of three children in her decision to declare gun violence a public health emergency. Most recently, an 11 year old boy was fatally shot outside a minor league baseball stadium in Albuquerque on Wednesday during a possible road rage incident, please say. Now, why is it only in these two areas of the state? Well, the suspension of open and concealed carry laws pertains to cities or counties averaging 1,000 or more violent crimes per 100,000 residents per year since 2021, and more than 90 firearm related emergency department visits per 100,000 residents from July 2022 to June 2023, according to the order. Bernalillo County and Albuquerque are the only two places in the state right now that meet those standards. Now, Senator Turner, it's nice and refreshing. Of course, you know, I don't think we'll have time to get into it, but the right wing is already trying to impeach her over this. But it's refreshing to see a governor see a horrible thing happen to children, children being murdered, and people are using these killing machines to do it and saying, enough, enough is enough. We got to do something right now to get this under control. And of course, the pushback is people are saying that I have more of a right to hold my, my gun than a child has to live, and it's disgusting. Yeah, it is. I mean, the way that the gun lobby, the NRA and others have co-opted this argument to make it seem like the Second Amendment is more absolute than any other, it is problematic. I have mixed feelings about this, Ray. A 30-day cooling off period. I mean, credit to Governor Grisham for thinking and trying to do something. I'm not so sure that this in itself is the fix. Mm -hmm. People could still carry guns on private property. It's only 30 days. It's only in certain counties. You know, as I'm often reminded by my conservative brother, you know, that people, the crim criminal element is not going to agree. They're not gonna follow this rule. They're still gonna carry their weapons. So overall, we have a gun problem in this country period. This fascination with weapons and of, of really mass destruction and why Americans in the psyche of America, not all Americans, but in our psyche, it has been overlaid that somehow guns are the way to go and it makes you feel more powerful and most more safe. When in fact, that is not necessarily the truth. So I will give her some credit, but I don't believe that this is the, is the fix, right? Yeah, definitely doesn't go far enough, especially considering I was just reading this morning that gun violence is the leading cause of death from children ages two to 19. So I mean, <laughs> a 30 day ban is definitely not gonna, you know, it's a band aid on a broken leg, but yeah. hopefully it'll mitigate some gun violence, but we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep you all updated, but that is 
all the time we have for now. We'll be back on the other side with the aftermath. So if you're watching on linear, switch over to YouTube or Twitch or head over to our website to check that out so you can get more Senator Turner, more me and more stories coming up. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.